quiet out here tonight. Let's all stand. Turn to page 320. We'll get started here. 320. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeem by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Oh, the soul-thrilling rapture when I view his blessed face and the luster of his kindly beaming eye. How my full heart will praise him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepare for me a mansion in the sky. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand on the last through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white he will lead me where no tears will ever fall in the glad song of ages i shall mingle with delight but i long to meet my savior first of all i shall know him i shall know him and redeemed by his side i shall stand i shall know him i shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand wonderful thank you brother daniel beautiful song i'm glad i'm gonna know him one of these days from seeing face to face i already know him in the power of the spirit and his word because it bears witness with my spirit. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. So good to see all of you here tonight. So thrilled you're here. And thank God for the blessings of the day. He's blessed us in so many ways. We have so much to thank him for and praise him for. Let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for the privilege to be in your house. What we're gathered here for. Thank you, Lord. For each one who's made their way here. And I thank you, Lord, for what you have in store for us. You're a great God. You've watched over us, took care of us, provided for our every needs today. And I just want to praise you for that, Lord. I don't want to ever take that for granted, what you do for us. And Lord, uh, you are a good God. We have so much to praise you for. And Lord, I'm glad we've come to worship you tonight and adore you and lift you up and look into your word and see what you have for us to help us. Thank you, Lord, for all of these that are here and the others that wanted to be here. Lord, there are some that are sick, inflicted in body and unable to come, but you know all about that, too, and you're able to help them and touch them and strengthen them. And I ask you, Lord, you do that in a real way. Meet these needs in accordance with your own perfect will, and we'll praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We're in for a good time tonight. Uh, kids' blast going to kick off here in just a little bit. And we're going to look into the Word of God, and we'll have our business meeting at the end. So I'm so glad you're here. Hey, Amen. Let's just go to meeting. Come on, Brother Daniel. Sing for us. Our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 though the 
darkness hide thee though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see only thou art holy there is none beside thee perfect in power in love and purity holy 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 lord god almighty all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea holy 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 merciful and mighty god in three persons blessed trinity Kids are headed to Kids Blast. Yes, sir. Sure. Come on. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Brother Barry. Amen. All right, kids. Kids are headed to Kids Blast. Wonderful. They're excited about that. And we're excited about them going to that. And we're excited about what God has for us in here. And all y'all jump up and get all excited at one time, I'll fall out. I'm glad we have a good time in here while they're having a good time out there. Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel, chapter number 12. I want to look into the Word of God tonight. And uh, I want to look at several of these verses tonight. I'll try to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to our time. I realize we have something else after this service. So uh, you listen fast. I'll try to preach fast. And do what God wants us to do tonight. Mark's Gospel, chapter number 12. Are you there? Good. Keep your Bibles open. Keep your Bibles open to Mark, chapter number 12. I'm not going to ask you to stand because I'm going to deal with these verses. If I were to ask you to stand for all the verses I'm going to read, you'd be standing the entire sermon. Because we're going to look at them tonight. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 13. Uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter number 13. Excuse me, chapter 12, verse 13. Get that right. Chapter 12, verse 13. Stay with me. Now, of course, the Bible, the book of Mark, was written by John Mark, uh, one of the disciples of the Lord. And, of course, uh, Peter, uh, I guess, was his personal witness to Mark as he pinned down the words that God would have him say. And Mark gives us a bird's eye view of what God is doing in the life of the Lord Jesus. Mark is one of the fastest moving of all the books, all the gospels. Mark is the fastest moving gospel. Uh, in his terminology, he takes us from place to place to place. He's getting the events down of what happened in the life of our Lord. His is the gospel of action. I like the book of Mark. I love to read the book of Mark. I love to study the book of Mark. And he's moving right along, step by step, in the life of the Lord Jesus. I've thought about it and even uh, somewhat prepared. I hadn't, uh, I'm like Brother Kevin, got to wait on the green light, uh, on a study on the life of the Lord Jesus, step by step, each event, and what, what it means to us. And, of course, it's a, it's a great, great, uh, great study to learn the life of the Lord, what he did while he was here upon this earth. But at this particular point that we're looking at, uh, in the life of our Lord, as you come to chapter number 12, uh, these Pharisees, these scribes, and these Sadducees have all come together. Now, they are, they are notorious enemies of each other. I'll say some more about that in a moment. But at this particular point, they have come together because they don't like this Lord Jesus. They don't like him at all. And they want to uh, uh, do away with him. They're wanting to kill him. That's their desire, is to kill him and get away from him and do away with him. And that's where we jump into this particular part of, Mark, part of Mark's gospel. And you need to look carefully at these things. We're going to see the enemies of the Lord Jesus and what they're doing at this particular point in his life and what they're desiring to do. And, of course, from them, uh, we're going to learn some great things. God took every 
I, in the life of the Lord, I wish I had time to explain it. I won't, I won't have time if I do that and then try to preach this message. But uh, when you study the life of our Lord, He is, let me make this statement. You write it down. Etch this in your heart. Jesus is our perfect example in everything. He's our perfect example. When they started throwing things at Him and started trying to trap Him, you watch what He does. You listen to what He says. And uh, boy, I'm telling you, God wants us to be like that. God wants us to be empowered with the Holy Spirit of God so that we can do that very thing and answer the questions that are thrown to us in this day in society and, and answer them correctly and biblically to draw attention to what's really happening behind the scenes to draw out of them. Now, of course, in this passage we're going to look tonight, if we get to them, there are three questions here that are asked in these verses of the Lord Jesus. And what they're literally trying to do is trying to trap him. Uh, they want to put him in some type of trap so that they can bring legal action against him and have him killed. It starts back in chapter 11, verse 27, I think it is, where they're asking him, what authority do you have? And they didn't like his answer. And from that moment, they began to conspire together. Now, uh, in history, they are uh, notorious enemies of each other. But here they come together to try to trap him. Look at verse 13 with me. And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and the Herodians, that's two different groups of people, to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they said unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. And then they asked this question, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? Is what they say there in the beginning of verse number 15. Now this is the first of three questions that actually answer the questions of life. If you study this chapter, it's amazing what it brings. Well, the whole of the Word of God has application for us in life today, what we need in life today. But here is uh, this group. They're trying their purposes to catch Jesus in some type of faulty charge so that they can bring charges against him. And these questions aren't really intended to uh, answer uh, we don't really want to answer. We want to trap you. See, they're, uh, they're under the bondage of Caesar and the Roman government, and yet so they're asking these questions, hoping he'll trip up and say the wrong thing so that they can say publicly why he, and of course they tried this, even in his trial, that he's not loyal to Caesar. You know, have him stoned, have him killed. And of course we know that the Lord Jesus gives the right answers. He always gives the right answers. When you study the questions that are in the Word of God and you find the answers in the Word of God, you'll find they're always the right answers. And so Jesus is the great question answer. He's the one who ultimately answers all the questions in the, in, that we face in life. And he helps us understand them. One of the criticisms some people have against the church today is they're answering questions that nobody's asking. But in reality, the church answers questions that need to be asked, and everyone will probably at some time or another ask in their life. And so we're constantly trying to help with the uh, most important questions of life. Uh, the, life about, uh, the questions about life itself. What is life all about? What is, uh, what is there after life? Is there an eternity? What about life and death? What about heaven and hell? What about the hereafter? And of course, uh, you and I, from the Word of God, we have the answers. And I didn't write the answers. I look at the answers. I trust the answers that God has given us from etern His eternal Word. The first question here is a, watch this now, stay with me, a political question. We have political questions that come up in our lives today. And this is one that they're putting the Lord Jesus on the spot with, a political question and it's concerning, watch this, the authorities of life. Who governs us? Who are we liable to? Who are we in charge to? Who are we responsible and accountable to? That's what they're trying to trip him up on this first question. 
And of course, uh, these natural enemies of the Lord, they couldn't stand one another, but yet they come together and group in together on things they know they personally disagree with, but they want to put Jesus on the spot so that they, can't, they can conspire together uh, to, to try to trap him. Now, they start, of course, with flattery. I always get worried when people say, I want to talk to you, and they start with flattery, and they start telling me how good I am. Uh, it kind of throws up a little question mark. Not always, but sometimes. And that's the same thing these, uh, these Pharisees and these uh, Herodians did, these scribes also. You'll see some of that in this chapter. And they come to him and said, Now, Lord, we know that, that you don't show favoritism. Lord, we know that you're not affected by the sway of the opinion of man, that you're going to give us the word of God. You're going to give us the truth. So then they pin him down to a political question. Is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar or not? Is it lawful? That's one of the burning questions of the day. We have it in our society today. I have people ask me, well, I, you know, I have people argue with me. I try to argue with me. Uh, the church shouldn't be involved in political things. Well, you better read your Bible. You better read your Bible. There's a right way and a right stance. And then I have other people say, well, you know, uh, you're disrupting the unity of the church. How about the church at large? When you uh, get involved and say things concerning uh, the political things. And of course, they base it on the church state relationship. And of course, the role of the state in life and the role of the church in life. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus deals here with. Where does it come together? Where does it stay separate? And what's it all about? Now, the Herodians said you ought not to pay tribute. They said you ought to pay tribute. They said, oh, yes, you ought to pay the Herodians. That's, I guess that's where they got their name, part of it from here. And said, so you ought to pay tribute. I mean, you ought to be lawful and, and pay, you, pay your taxes. They took the side of the government, and they said you ought to pay taxes, and you ought to pay the, your tribute, too. Now, of course, I'll explain that in a minute, what it relates to of the tribute and the taxes. On the other hand, the Pharisee says, not on your life. We are, we are allegiant to one, and that is God. We're not allegiant to no government here. We're not allegiant to nobody here. It's unfaithful and disloyal to God when you pay tribute to Caesar. Some, pay, some said you ought to pay tribute. Others said you ought not. So they brought this question to the Lord Jesus. And in this public forum, they asked him, uh, this particular question, is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar or no? Now, if you study the life of the Lord, this is right about tax time, right before tax time in the life of the Lord. And, of course, he's, uh, they're putting him on the spot. They're going to try to trap him to say, well, if he says no, you shouldn't pay tribute. Well, we can run with that and tell, uh, tell these Romans, boy, he's, uh, he's starting an anar anarchy against the Roman government. We can, they can put that down in a heartbeat. You know, they can kill you for that. That's against the law. But if he says yes, then we can run to the religious crowd, the religious sect, and say he holds no regard for his allegiance to God. What we ought to do uh, as far as uh, citizens of God and people of God. And he, he, Jesus said, uh, you, you know, are you supposed to ask, are you supposed to pay taxes? Uh, that would get him in trouble with the government if he said no. And if he says yes, that's going to get him in trouble with these religious crowds. So they brought, they thought they had a question that would get him. And I want you to look at it, verse 15. He said, why tempt ye me? They're trying to trap him, and he realizes that, so he just brings it to the head. Why are you trying to trap me? Why are you trying to tempt me? And then he says these words, bring me a penny that I may see it. And that was the silver coin uh, back in those days, the tribute to Caesar that everybody paid. Everybody paid taxes to Rome, and they brought it, and I can almost see them fumbling out of their pocket, each one of them trying to get him a coin the quickest. They, they want to hand it to him, see what his answer is. And they hand it to the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus took the coin, and I believe he begins to talk holding up this coin in front of their eyes. Verse 16, he said, Who is this image and superscription? And when you look at that coin of that day, it had on one side the image of Caesar, like we do on our coins, presidents and 
uh, different things. Of course, they've changed them all, are changing a lot of them in different regard now. But uh, on the front of that coin, it had uh, Caesar's picture. On the other side was the superscriptions, which basically assigned uh, quad, uh, qualities of deity to the Roman emperor. And they were to give that coin in their taxes. They were to take that coin every year and show their allegiance to the Roman government, I guess in some matter. And so the Lord takes this coin and Jesus holds it up and he asks the question, whose superscription is this? Who's, whose superscription? Who's on this? Whose image and superscription is on this coin? And they answered and said unto him, Caesar's. Then the Lord Jesus answers, verse 17, he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And that's absolutely brilliant. They thought they had him trapped, thought they was going to get him. And he says, well, whose coin is this? You're paying taxes with this coin. This is coin you use to pay your taxes. Whose coin is this anyway? He said, well, render it to Caesar. It belongs to Caesar, give it to Caesar. Uh, and, of course, he's basically uh, in this coinage of Rome. They were admitting Rome had a legal right or realm in their lives. And can I tell you that's true in our lives today, too. You study the Word of God, you'll find out God raises up governments and God takes down governments. And he uses us as his people to do some of that very thing. And, of course, we're obligated, uh, we're commanded, I believe, from the Scriptures, and we have a responsibility. So the Lord Jesus is simply saying, in the verse, uh, very use of the coin, they admit their le legitimate role in the government of their lives. And, of course, this is the principle the Lord Jesus has laid down, the principle concerning what? The authorities of life. Now, you think about that for a second. I don't like the way our government's doing things. I don't either. That's the reason I vote. I don't like what do so and so's doing. That's the reason I call them up and tell them. I'm an American citizen. I was born here, raised here. I have a rights here that God has given me. And so I, you know what a lot of people do? They sit back and complain. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And yet we know that the, what the Bible says, you go to Romans chapter 13, and it talks about, it makes it clear that a Christian is supposed to be a good citizen. We're supposed to honor those things of God. And when they come in conflict, conflict with the Word of God, we're supposed to stand against them. We are to stand up. The Bible makes it clear. You and I are to pay our bills. You and I are to obey the laws of the land. You and I are to pay our fair portion of taxes. And when they get too high, you and I ought to stand up and say, hey, that's taxation without representation, as our forefathers did and said, that's, that's wrong. You can't do this. This is wrong. What you're doing, the infliction you're doing upon people, it's wrong. You say, you think that's, that's exactly the way we ought to do it. Why you say that, preacher? Think about it. What would it be without a government? Where would you be tonight without a government? Who are you going to call? Huh? We ain't got some type of order and law and system in our life, in our life and in our lands. Who are you going to call? God implemented that. God ordained government. And he wants it to be run civil and right and honoring to him. Recognizing him. That's what our forefathers did. That's exactly what they did. And so there has to be some guidelines in our society. And of course you and I have to admit sometimes it's irritating de dealing with the government. I should have got an amen from everybody in here. Has ever had any dealings with the government? The government don't bother y'all then. I mean they make some of the silliest things and some of the silliest uh, laws and I'm just telling you, some of the silliest, they promote some of the silliest. And, of course, we've got to, in our government now some anti-God stuff going on. We definitely need to be standing against that. I was reading about uh, some, of the, some of the silliest things the government's ever issued, ever published, ever put out information. There's a list of them. I was thinking about it. Of course, our son lives out near St. Helens, and St. Helens erupted a few years ago. And the government was quick to have a response to the people surrounding Mount St. Helens in an effort to help them, to instruct them. You know what they said? The government guidelines said, move away from the volcano, not toward it. I'm going to tell you how much money they spent publishing this information. Well, that's common sense. <laughs> 
They're real smart, ain't they? It takes government to come up with that. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit uh, upsets us. You know, we pay more taxes than we should, I believe. And of course, uh, the Bible talks about the right representation, but it also talks about how we ought to uh, uh, do things honestly and openly and these other things. And of course, we realize in our society, we need help with that today. We need a government that is more transparent. And they talk about it, but they don't do it. And we need people that, uh, of course, will stand for that which is right, regardless of what party, and stand for that which is right, regardless of, of what, what it's all about, uh, not so, give in to some small minority uh, empathy that wants something done that's contrary to what the effects of the people will be, what it, how it affect the people. God implementing, God put into government, but God also holds us accountable for what we do in our government, I believe. Verse 17, render to God the things that are God's. Now you and I have a responsibility. Here's two realms of authority in the human life. Here's two realms of, go of government and the realm of God that God holds us accountable, I believe, for both. He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That that, that uh, leads to an accountability on our part to the government. And I believe part of that accountability is hold them responsible. Hold them responsible. When's the last time you told your representative, I'm holding you responsible, man? Uh, we're, we're depending on you over here in this county. We're depending on you over here in this land. Man, you've got to do what's right. That's what we put you in there for. Stand, stand on the line. Do what's right. When's the last time you told your representative that? I've told some of them that more than once, and I'm grateful and thankful I have. And, and just like this coin of Caesar's inscription here, the Bible says you and I are made in the image of God. So he says, he goes on to say in there, we're to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and just important, we're to render to God the things that are God's. We're accountable to God. You see the parallel there? You, you see what the Lord's trying to show us here in this verse, these verses in his answer? The Bible says God is the spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There's something about that that you and I ought to respond to God in and be accountable to God. There's something about you that responds to God. It's that spirit that God put in you and you, God has given you that spirit and God has enabled you with the power of his spirit. You and I have a responsibility to respond to God and especially in the things of the government. Respond to God. Now, before we get through tonight, we'll have an invitation. God wants us to respond. When we come to the house of God, he wants us to do business with him. We're held accountable, I believe, for when we hear and don't respond. God's interested in, in, in doing that work in our hearts. It's not just about the civil things. It's not just about uh, the, the physical things around us. It's about the spiritual things too. How, tune, how in tune we are with God, walking with God. And Jesus answers this question. He renders unto God that which is God's. He renders unto Caesar that which is Caesar. So the answer is, of course, the solution is what? As somebody says, either or. No, it's both and. We're held accountable for both. Our government and God. He holds us accountable. He didn't put us here by accident. I thank him. I thank him almost every day that I remember it. I thank him for the land in which I live and the freedoms I enjoy because I realize everybody don't have them. And you ought to, too. Here in America, God has given us and blessed us. I believe with our forefathers had a belief in God, a God-given right and responsibility to what? To choose our leader. You have a choice. You say, I don't like neither one of them. Well, you, you ought to choose which one you want to lead our country for the next four years because one of them is. So what's going to happen? I just ain't going to get involved in politics. You'll stand accountable for God. You have, a, you have a reasonable obligation to your grandkids and kids. Oh, my. Let me hasten to the second question. Life's realities, the realities of life. That's a doctrinal question. He answers a political question, but then he answers a doctrinal question. Now look at it with me, verse 18. Then come unto him the Sadducees, 
which say there is no resurrection. That wraps it up, don't it? I mean, these folks, uh, they just didn't believe in the supernatural. They're anti-supernaturalists. And of course, they don't believe in the su supernatural world. They don't believe in the things of God, God performing miracles and God doing things. These Sadducees were not a very large group compared to the Pharisees, but they were a very uh, potential group. And they were a wealthy group. They were aristocrats. And uh, of course, these people, uh, they come and of course, they come uh, to the Sadducees. They, they are the Sadducees. They come to the Pharisees, and they hated the Pharisees, but yet when it come to Jesus, they hated him more. And so they want to ask some questions, too. They're rationalists. They're liberals. Uh, they don't believe in the resurrection. They didn't even believe in angels. They didn't believe in anything supernatural. Somebody said they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's the reason they're sad, you see. I believe that's true. Verse 19, they said, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. That's Deuteronomy chapter 25. You can read that Levitical law. It dealt with, of course, God's people, the Jews, and it dealt with mainly, of course, their portion of lands that were given them coming into coming out into the promised land. How that they had uh, lands that were dictated to them and given to them certain tribes of people and they were not to sell them, they were not to lose them. And if you remember that principle and study the word of God, it'll make a lot more sense to you. Especially when you come to books like Ruth and, and Joshua and some of these other books. It tends to show a slide of things. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5, Levitical marriage, it talks about it, how they were devised. This, this law was given by God. If a man's family would die, his brother's wife or his wife, his brother would take him in and, 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 uh, and prosper his, his, uh, his land and prosper his deed and title. It would remain in the family like the farms of our south now today. A lot of them are being sold. This was the law. This was the truth. It's just a little thing, but yet they're going to make a big thing out of it. Watch it. Verse number 20. Then they were, they, I believe they make up this story. There were seven brothers, brethren. The first took a wife and died and left no seed. He died and had no children. Verse 21. And the second took her, one of his brother's wife, took his wife and died. Neither left he any seed. And the third likewise. And the seventh, the seven had her and no left no seed, no children. Last of all, the woman died also. Verse 23. Watch this. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. You see the story? They, they make up, I believe, this fictitious story about a seven brothers, and this man's one of them's wife, and the, this brother dies, he has no kids, so the second one takes him, the nearest brother takes him. I've often said that to my wife, how'd you like to be married to my brother? I'm glad that's not true today, aren't you? Every woman in here should have said amen right there. Amen. You didn't marry his brother, you married him. <laughs> Karen said, I wouldn't marry some of your brothers. I said, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but but in the story here, that's what happened. They, they, they trying to trying to, to initiate the family, keep the family going. In verse twenty three, the Sadducees said, "Watch this. In the resurrection, whose wife is she going to be?" Now they stand back and they look probably at these Pharisees and they giggle because they don't even believe in the resurrection. But yet they're asking him a resurrection question, a doctrinal question for their unbelief. They're asking this question. They're making light of, can I tell you what they're doing? They're making light of life and death issues. Life and death is very serious to God. That's why he give it to us. That's why it's so sacred to us. That's why we ought to hold it of great value. But they didn't. Like so many people in our society, they, they didn't hold it of great value. They laughed at it. They mocked at it. They're making uh, purest uh, little problems out of this issue of life and death and the resurrection. They're talking about life and they're talking about death and they're talking about the afterlife. Do you know that's issues that everyone faces? You with me? That's issues every one of us think about at some time or another. 
And can I tell you, the older we get, the more we think about it. Because it gets closer. You say, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. A lot of people don't. In their younger years, you know, the Bible says it's appointed unto men wants to die. And unless the Lord comes back in our lifetime, it's going to happen to every one of us. We're going to face death. Every one of us. I faced it in the last two weeks in my own family. First and second cousin. I had the funerals in the last two weeks. One one week, one the next. Seemed like. Right around there anyway. Somewhere out there in the future, I hope, far in the future for all of you here tonight, but you're going to face death. Every one of us is coming closer and closer to death every day. And, of course, God has it. And the big question is, are you prepared? Are you prepared to die? Are you ready to die? Someone said it. I think it's right. I think it's very clear. You're not ready to live till you're ready to die. Because you live under an umbrella, waiting on it to rain. When God gives you the assurance of, of, of life after death and where you're going and where you're headed, you can come out from under the umbrella because it don't matter when it rains. God's already got it. Hello? That's true. And the Lord Jesus deals with this matter of life and death. It's appointed unto me and wants to die. And Jesus dealt with that very thing. These Sadducees are making a lot of the issues a very important and a very serious thing. And uh, I, I'm thankful that God, the Lord Jesus, answers this question. They really hit uh, down where we live. In the resurrection, what's going to happen? They asked the Lord Jesus. What's it going to be like in the resurrection? Years ago, one of our presidents, President Eisenhower, said, I'm interested in eternity. I'm going to spend the rest of my life there. You thought about it? You are too. Have you thought about the afterlife? It's indeed a part of the resurrection question. Now, let me just show that to you. Most people think about it at some time or another. Prove it to you. What's usually our biggest crowd? Easter. Exactly right. Because people are interested to hear that story of how Jesus rose up from the dead, how he got up, how there's life after this life, how there's eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in the human nature, there is a, there is a need to answer that question because we know death is coming. Job answered that question. He said, he asked that question. God answered that question. If a man dies, shall he live again? Absolutely. And that dad of yours who died a few years ago, will you ever see him again? Many people ponder that question. That mom of yours, that, that sweet, delicate woman that brought you into this world, your mom, will you ever see her again? According to the word of God, it's not over. It's not the end for the children of God. When death comes, the Sadducees, there is no afterlife. Oh, but there is. Jesus is answering this question. Jesus is going to answer this question. In the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? Verse 24. The Lord Jesus, he's not smiling. He knows you're making light of something very serious. And he brings them back, what, to the word of God. Now watch this response. Do you not therefore err because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? I believe as a class of people in our society, boy, that fits them perfectly. That fits them perfectly. They ask some of the foolish questions, looking for the uh, reasoning of life and all these other things and asking actually the wrong questions in life. And I believe the answer uh, to them is you, you, you err because you don't know what the scripture says and you don't know the power of God. You don't know. You're missing it. You're missing everything there is. Uh, that's probably one of the best definitions of a liberal I ever read. Right there. You don't know the scriptures. You, you know not the power of God. Uh, don't you know the power of God? Don't you know the word of God? What God said in his words? And, and what he said to us, the promises he gave. Look at verse 25. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor give it in marriage but as the angels which are in heaven. He said the power of God's going to do something in, the, in their lives, transform them. It's going to be amazing. He's talking about a relationship which is so beautiful that it far exceeds, supersedes this life, what we know in relationships. 
It's going to be so wonderful. We can't understand it. Many people can't comprehend it. Some people have a problem with it. The afterlife of knowing each other, but yet not being in the same uh, con- uh, c- c- relationship that we have here. The Bible says, eyes not seen, eyes not seen, neither is ear heard, neither is entered to the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for those that love him. Uh, we can't even imagine. We, we can't even begin to think. You know, God gives us little glimpses along the way of his power and the little glimpses in his word of what it's going to be like in the afterlife, what it's going to be like in heaven. I've often said he didn't give us the whole picture because we couldn't handle it and we'd be like kids. We'd want dessert before, before what we really need, the vegetables. Huh? And that's true. The more you read the book, and the more you read and study about heaven and, and the book of Revelation, I, I think John saw so many things, and I believe he tried his best to write them down with the knowledge and the wisdom that God had given him, the things he could understand. But I believe his, uh, even in his ability of compared to what he was seeing and trying to write, he said, there ain't a language for it. I, I, I don't know how to describe it. I, I don't know how to pin it down. He said, our relationships will be different, supersede, be like the angels. Now, he didn't say you'd be an angel. Some people confuse that. Now, I'm not going to be an angel. I'm going to be as angels. You know what that means? A new kind of existence for the child of God. You ever thought about it? And he said we'd have a body like his body when he rose from the dead. What was his body like? Uh, somebody said, well, well, I know my, my wife in heaven. Well, I know people. I, I've, I've had this relationship with her for years. Well, well, I know her. Yeah, you'll know her in heaven, but it'd be in a different manner, a different way. It'd still be good. It'd far succeed, It'd supersede anything you got now. I believe it will be. She says, Karen can't wait. She won't be married to me no more. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Won't be no marriages in heaven. Oh, you see, our relationships will supersede all that. Be beyond that. Can you imagine beyond a relationship? Most of you here tonight have a great or have had a strong relationship with your spouse. And you've been through many things together and you're still uh, living together and enjoying life together. And of course, we, we can't even begin to imagine or we can't, can't even begin to think about uh, not having our spouse or not being married to our spouse or not having the relationship that we have now. It's so good. Every married person in here should have said amen right there. You missed it. She should have. It's so good. I told my wife last night how good, I, how thankful I am for her and our relationship. What? But when you get to the next life, boy, it's going to far succeed that. Can't even imagine. Can't even comprehend it. Verse 26, Jesus goes on to make this point quite, quite clear. You know what he said in verse 26? And as touching the dead, they that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. You know what he's saying? He said, you worried about this death stuff and how it's going to change everything. He said, God is the God of the living. Not of the dead. He's a God of the living. He brings to their remembrance Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob Long since dead, but yet God refers to them as what? In a conscious state. He refers to them as still alive. He refers to them in the same type of relationship. He's talking about it. The living God is not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. You lose your relationship. No, you have a greater relationship. And it's with God and with each other. A greater relationship. Can you imagine a greater relationship maybe than you have now? Somebody said, you just wouldn't believe my wife. You just wouldn't believe my husband. He's the best on the face of this earth. I hope you still feel that way. You should. I won't tell you, it's going to get even sweeter. It's going to get even better. We're in Christ. Paul talked about it. We're in Christ Jesus. Be in Christ Jesus. We're in Christ. We know Christ by faith, but one day we'll see him face to face. And that relationship will far exceed any relationship we have now with him. Oh my, think about it. Jesus Christ is the only person that ever lived and died and went into the afterlife and come back and explained it to us. 
and told us what it's going to be like, described to us what life is like and what it's like on the other side, on the other side of death. And I'm glad we put our faith and trust in him. Oh, I'm glad there's more beyond this life. They made that uh, statue of that lion that had the world on it there in Spain when, when uh, Columbus, uh, before Columbus ever sailed. They said, no more beyond is what it said in uh, Latin or Spanish one. And they put on there that world, holding the world, a lion holding the world, no more beyond. Talking about no more beyond this world. Columbus made that voyage returned and they had to inscribe something else. They had to put something else. It said on it, nothing beyond. That's what they wrote on those words. And they had to change it from nothing beyond to more beyond. There's more beyond this. There's more beyond this world. I'm glad the Lord Jesus is simply saying to us, there's more beyond. One of these days you and I are going to take this body and it's going to be changed. This body ain't going to make it, but it's going to be changed the moment of twinkling of eye. Now, hey, if the Lord don't come back in my lifetime, somebody will get a call. Somebody will take this old body. They'll embalm it. They'll make it look as good as they can, Brother Mick. They'll shine me up as much as they can make me look as good as I can, make me smell as good as I can. And who knows, it may roll me right down here, right down front here. I lay in a corpse, and people come by, and they'll say some of the most silly things. Boy, don't he look good? No, I'm dead. That's what they'll say, huh? Look at him. He, he's not alive. I, I was telling Brother Bobby this other day, me and him tell each other jokes. These three old guys was talking about, to, they was talking about which, what, what they wanted in their after, uh, at their funeral services, they got thinking about death, and a friend of theirs died, so they got talking about it in the service, how good it was. And they asked each other, what would you like said at your funeral? One guy said, well, I'd like them to stand up there and say, he was a good man, he was a good husband, he was a good father, he was very, very noted for the love and compassion he had in his life. The other guy said, yeah, it'd be wonderful. I'd like for him to say something like that about me. But I wanted to mention uh, what I've accomplished in life. I've accomplished a lot of things in life. I've done a lot of things in life. I wanted to mention, boy, the goals I set and the things I've done, how it impacted others, helped others, how I helped others. The last guy said, they learned to him, they asked him, said, what do you want him to say? He said, I'd like for one of them to walk by and say, hey, look, he's moving. Uh -huh. One day they may lay me down here and somebody walk by and say, boy, Brother Joel, he's dead. That's a lie. I'll be more alive than I've ever been. You remember that old shell may be laying there. It's, it's faced death. Hallelujah, I won't be there. I won't have any restrictions of the body anymore. Get that glorified body. I won't have any restrictions anymore. The Bible talks about it. I'll be more alive than I've ever been. Hallelujah. I'll have that glorified body like Jesus. Well, what kind of body is that? Well, he, he, uh, he was able to be in a place just by thinking, I believe. Thought process. Transport. <laughs> It'll put Star Trek to shame. There won't be no beam me up, Scotty. God give us that power. Be glorified. There won't be no walls or doors stop us. Didn't stop the Lord Jesus. And we'll know the peace and the realness of God like we've never known. Here's the last question. The spiritual question. What is that? The priorities of life. It says here in verse number 38, excuse me, 28, one of the scribes, and we've talked to the Pharisees, we've talked to the Herodians, one of the scribes, it seems like this one's more sincere than the others. It seems like this one has an insight of what God's really wanting to do and say, and he realizes this has been a trickery scene. And he asked the Lord, having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that they, uh, he had answered them well, he asked, which is the first commandment of all? He's inquiring. He's a scribe. He writes down the scriptures. He copies off the scriptures. Uh, scriptures. This is the big question of life. What is the big, what is the first commandment of all? He's a law expert. He knows this Old Testament law back and forth. He's written it down many, many times. And he's watched them. He, he's watched as they've brought out these laws, 613 commandments of God. And they've been divided. He's watched as they've squabbled and and uh, gobbled over all these laws, these commandments. And you know what they've done? They've made big laws and little laws. This is a big law. This is a little law. And they've discussed it. 
And so he asked the Lord Jesus, the law giver and the, the law fulfiller, what's the greatest commandment of all? They had been become the authorities. They could say something about this law is better than that one or this is more important than that one. They had made it so complicated, the people of their day had made it so complicated. Sort of like people in our society do sometimes. I heard a fellow talking the other day, he said that. He, he said, we're learning more and more about less and less. We're learning more and more about less and less. He said, pretty soon, uh, we'll know everything about nothing. I thought that was pretty good. Huh? And Jesus, looks at, look at it, verse 29. What's the greatest commandment? Which is the greatest commandment of all? Jesus said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He's relating to these, what, religious folk. So he's talking to them. I believe that's why he answered that question the way he did. He always has the perfect answer. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God, verse 30, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, verse 31. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandments greater than than these. You see what Jesus is doing here? Jesus took all the commandments of God and he said, you're trying to figure them out, which one you ought to keep, which one you let go, which one you let slide. He said, the greatest thing in the world is to love God with your whole being. That's the greatest commandment. So if you really love God with your whole being, you'll follow the principles of God in your life and it's amazing. Obeying the second commandment won't be near as hard. Huh? You get the first one right, the second one ain't that hard. When you fall in love with Jesus, when you really love him, can, can you say that in your heart, I love God with all my heart? I'm sure there's times in our lives that we feel like we do. And I'm thankful. I'm glad I do. I, I do sometimes. Most of the time I try to. Every day I want to renew that vow with him again. So, Lord, I want to love you with all my heart. Can I tell you? Watch this now. I was talking to a guy just... Just uh, Friday, uh, after that funeral, I was talking to a guy. We were talking in depth, and he, he, he started talking about that. And he said, he, he said uh, something about, uh, you know, uh, the Bible commands us a lot about being a husband. I said, yeah, sure does. A lot of responsibility. And he said, I've got kids. I'm trying to train, teach them. And I said this. He said, the Bible commands us to love God with all of our heart. And can I tell you, brother? If you love God with all your heart like you should, you'll love your wife like you should. You'll love your children like you should. It'll make a difference in the way you live if you really love God with all your heart. It brings you closer. I told him. I said, well, I counsel couples that's going to get married. I, I, I draw a triangle. I said, God is here. You bride are here. You groom are here. And the closer y'all get to God, closer you get to each other. That's amazing. That's true. I found it true in my own life in my own relationship. I'm telling you uh, God has a way of doing that. Verse 32, I'm done. Master, thou hast said true, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And he begins to re repeat the things that the Lord Jesus has said there about loving God with all your heart. And then in verse 34, Jesus, the Bible says this about the Lord. When Jesus saw that the man answered discreetly or wisely is what that means, Jesus looks at that man and he says, watch this. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. God's doing a work in his heart. God's doing a work in our hearts. And I'm glad as we obey him. Hallelujah. He can do the greatest work. The greatest work he's ever done in our lives. Take us off the road to hell and put us on the road to heaven. Change our life for all of eternity. Become Lord and Master of our lives. Do you know him as personal Savior? Let's stand for prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing a verse of invitation. If God's spoken to your heart about anything in this sermon or anything in your life, these altars are always open. I thank God for people that are obedient to him to come and pray and seek God and seek God's will for their life and want what God has for them or intercede for others. 
You do what God tells you to do tonight. Will you, Father, I want to thank you again for the privilege. Stay and proclaim your word. Thank you, Lord, for what we've seen tonight from these questions that were asked of you. And I'm glad, Lord, you have the answers. I'm glad, Lord, you are a great God that can help us in every situation of life. Help us, Lord, to be the people you want us to, to be and do that work that only you can do in our hearts. There's one on the sound of my voice that's never trusted you as Savior. You've opened their heart to that truth, their reality that they need you more than they need anything else in life. I pray, Lord, they call upon your name tonight and trust you is their only hope of heaven. I'm glad you'll save them, you'll forgive them, you'll change their life, you'll give them a home in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. We're singing 365. God spoke to your heart. You need to come, you come. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one.